not. Uh, he will be coming at another time, uh, and I'm the very poor substitute. Uh, uh, but there's good news, uh, and that is that I spend a lot of time working with the active First Division, and I was fortunate enough last month to go to Iraq and visit their headquarters, and so I thought I'd spend a little time uh, talking about that experience. I think most of you have been here, but if in the event that there's someone who hasn't been to one of these, uh, Cantini, as you know, is the historic estate of the late Colonel Robert R. McCormick, longtime owner and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, very wealthy man, powerful in business and politics and all of that sort of thing. Uh, he lived here on the estate, but of his many, many achievements, there was none he was more proud of than his service as a citizen soldier in the 1st Division of the U.S. Army in World War I. And in fact, he uh, fought at the Battle of Cantini, a tiny little village in France, uh, which was America's first battle in Europe, uh, not just in World War I, but uh, the first time we ever fought in Europe. First battle in the history of the 1st Infantry Division. And he came back and renamed this estate Cantini in honor of the battle, was devoted to veterans and soldiers in the 1st Division for the rest of his life, died, didn't have kids, left his considerable uh, wealth to uh, create our parent foundation, the Robert R. McCormick Foundation in Chicago, which is a major philanthropy. And then he said, turn this into a park for the people of Illinois. If you've come from Wisconsin, Indiana, or Iowa, you are equally welcome. We we're uh, glad to have you. Uh, so I thought I would talk, and this is also, this is 2017. The day after tomorrow, June 8, 1917, it'll be 100 years since the 1st Infantry Division, actually at that time called the 1st Division, was organized on the docks of Hoboken, New Jersey, just before they deployed to France from World War I. They were America's 1st Division. We have fielded a lot of divisions since then. Uh, there's no way that the 1st Division fought our wars all by itself. Uh, but it has been on continuous active duty. Not a day has gone by since June 8, 1917 that we have not been served by the men and women of the Big Red One. And so we're very, very proud to tell that story in the museum. And I thought it would be appropriate tonight to bring you up to date on what that division is doing 100 years after its founding. Uh, this is the talk you could have had if uh, Greg knew how to ride a bike. <laughs> and I promise that he will be back. He'll be back more than once. And uh, so look, watch that, uh, watch our promotions for that, and, uh, uh, and come meet uh, Greg and read his book. It's fabulous. It, and it is the first scholarly treatment of a division in Desert Storm. And Desert Storm gets overlooked by historians a little bit because it was a brief war and almost casually free from the perspective of the United States. Um, but it was our first engagement in the post-World War II era in the Middle East. And some would say, uh, we've never left, and we haven't. We fought Desert Storm and we've been in the Persian Gulf militarily ever since, and it's been 26 years. So, um, so there's that. And then I would be very remiss as a historian of the 1st Infantry Division if I didn't acknowledge the 73rd anniversary today of the landing in Normandy. The 1st Division, as you may or may not know, was the lead assault division on Omaha Beach, which of the five Allied beaches was by far and above the hardest fight and the most critical piece of terrain to take in that invasion. And so, uh, I often say it's fun, it's exciting, it's interesting to, to, to have 100 years of American military history as the focus for our museum, but we never want to forget that that history is founded on the sacrifice of thousands of American soldiers uh, wearing the shoulder patch of the 1st Infantry Division. Uh, the 1st Infantry Division, I, I think June 6, 1944, was the single most important day in the 100-year history of the 1st Infantry Division, and it was the bloodiest day for the division in all of World War II. And so uh, we would be remiss not to acknowledge that. Uh, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about tonight. 
I'm gonna talk about what the big red one is doing today. And uh, I think most of you know that it's stationed uh, at Fort Riley, Kansas, right in the center of Kansas, not uh, just west of Manhattan, Kansas, where Kansas State University is, and right next to the beautiful little town of Junction City, so-called because it's been a railroad junction since about 1870. Uh, that's the home station. Now, we use our divisions, uh, and the regular Army has 10 active divisions, a division of about 15, 16, 17,000 troops, depending on what kind of division. In 2006, we changed entirely how we use divisions. And so it is possible to pick the whole 1st Infantry Division up and send it somewhere and have it fight another war like we did in Desert Storm or Vietnam or World War II or World War I. But we don't use any of our divisions that way these days. We have so many military commitments around the world that we've uh, the divisions are organized into self-sustaining brigade combat teams, and those brigade combat teams are rotated to the various places around the world where we think we need troops. And that's a more flexible system, according to the Army, than permanently stationing big divisions on a continent overseas, like in Europe, like the 7th Army used to be in Europe, or the 8th Army in Korea, and so on and so forth, because our security challenges shift pretty quickly. And so we want to have this more flexible uh, uh, system. So Fort Riley is like, a, it, uh, the Army jargon is, it, is a deployment platform. It is a place where the soldiers are when they're not deployed. And it's a place where they can rest, it's a place where their families live, it's a place where they can train, and it's a place from which they will uh, deploy again, and I'll show you examples of that tonight. So a year ago, just about exactly a year ago, I went to Kuwait to visit the 2nd Armored Brigade Combat Team of the 1st Infantry Division. And since in that year, here's what your division has been doing. Uh, its headquarters is in Iraq, and I'm gonna talk about that tonight. Uh, that's the brigade that was in Kuwait. It came home at the end of 2016. Uh, its aviation brigade just got back last month from a nine-month deployment to Afghanistan. Its first brigade combat team is in Korea uh, as part of our deterrent against North Korea. And that same brigade that I visited a year ago, uh, the second brigade that was in Kuwait, it's back at Fort Riley now, but it just got orders to Poland and it will deploy before the end of this year and be in Eastern Europe. And so what you can see from this map is that the 1st Infantry Division is in every hotspot that challenges American security today. In the last 18 months, you could fly around the world, you could visit every trouble spot, and you would find the soldiers of the 1st Infantry Division. Now, that's a big deal to me because I'm a fan of the 1st Infantry Division, but frankly, it's the same for all the other divisions, right? When, when the brigade combat teams deploy, in most of these places, they're replacing somebody else who's there. For instance, the mission that the 2nd Brigade will assume in Europe at the end of this year is currently being performed by the 3rd Brigade Combat Team of the 4th Infantry Division, and they'll come home, 1st Division goes there. So, I think this is really cool, but I could be standing here talking about the 101st Airborne Division, the 1st Cavalry Division, the 4th Infantry Division, I'd be telling essentially the same story. Uh, but anyway, there you are. Uh, so what are some of these missions? Well, this is the 2nd Armored Brigade Combat Team in Operation Spartan Shield in Kuwait in, 19, in 2016. Now what's all that about? Well, Kuwait is in a really, really, really strategically important part of the world. It's at the head of the Persian Gulf. It is adjacent to all of the oil refineries that bring the energy resources of the uh, Middle East uh, to the shipping lanes of the Persian Gulf. This has been a contentious issue since the 1930s. Uh, of course, it's next to Iraq. Uh, Iraq has had a fistful of troubles for years and years and years and years and years. Kuwait is an important ally, has been for the last 26 years since uh, it was liberated from the Iraqis in Operation Desert Storm. 
Uh, and so we have an American Brigade combat team there all the time. Now what do they do? For the most part they train. But they have an on, they, they, and, and Kuwait is, except for Kuwait City, Kuwait's a desert. So if you are a tank outfit, it's kind of heaven because you can drive anywhere you want, shoot any direction you want, and you're not going to hurt a thing. You'll scare the camels. But there's really nothing out there, right? Uh, so in that sense, uh, it's, it's an okay place to be. Uh, that brigade has on-order missions to respond to any crisis in the CENTCOM area of responsibility. That's the United States Central Command, and their area of responsibility is huge. So should we get into a real problem, we've got a brigade right there. Biggest problem that we might get into is some kind of a disaster uh, in Iraq. And of course, that was uh, very much on everybody's mind when ISIS was knocking on the door of Baghdad in 2014. Uh, the other thing they do, so they train and maintain readiness, they're ready to respond to crises throughout the area, and the other thing they do is they do military assistance uh, training and exercises with friendly countries throughout the, uh, uh, the Middle East and South Asia. So in this, uh, that's outside their headquarters, this is an exercise we're doing in Jordan, and this is me out watching them train. They, that's a big piece of engineer equipment there, and this is a Bradley fighting vehicle. You can't see this very well, and we're gonna put it on display in the museum when we reopen. But that's a map of the Middle East, and the CENTCOM, United States Central Command area of responsibility, the CENTCOM AOR. So there's Iraq, there's tiny little Kuwait, that's where that brigade is. Here's the rest of this AOR. And all of these stars and diamonds and shapes and triangles that you see here, all of those are different operations or exercises that that brigade to, uh, 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 went on or, um, uh, or underwent, I think that's the word that I'm trying to use, that I'm, that I'm struggling for, in that nine month deployment in 2016. And when they showed me that map, they were only six months into that deployment. They still had three months to go. So they've been all over that area. And look at this. There's a green triangle, I'm not sure what, all the way up there in Kazakhstan. So from Kuwait, they were deploying troops up into Kazakhstan to take care of some piece of uh, training assistance, undoubtedly, that the Kazakhs had asked us to come in and help them with. And we said, roger that, and off we went. You can see how much attention we pay to Jordan. Look at all of the effort there. And that's because Jordan is a very, very important country. Jordan has signed peace with Israel. Jordan is a Muslim country, but a moderate Muslim country with a democratic, a mix of democratic and royal government. And it's right on the border with Syria. It, has, it is strongly threatened by ISIS. Uh, and so we pay, we pay a lot of attention making sure that Jordan is stable and secure and that we respond to requests from assistance uh, from the government of Jordan. So that your, your soldiers, when they're deployed, they are not asleep in a hammock somewhere, okay? They're not in the mess hall doing KP. Civilian contractors do that. There is no more KP, okay? They're out working, and they're working hard. So that's the big message there. So let's talk about the Combat Aviation Brigade. Every division in the Army has an, a Combat Aviation Brigade of helicopters. The Army doesn't have any fixed wing aircraft, they're all rotary wing or helicopters. And uh, a division's Combat Aviation Brigade is somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 helicopters. That's a lot of helicopters. And there are attack helicopters that fire missiles and guns. There are reconnaissance helicopters that go look for stuff. There's assault helicopters that carry combat troops into battle, and there are medium lift helicopters that uh, lift big heavy things and carry them around wherever the Army needs them to go. So that, for instance, that's a CH-47 Chinook uh, medium lift helicopter. When I was in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, my little daughters would call it a double whirly because it's got two, <laughs> two uh, props on it. Uh, but uh, uh, at, at any rate, they were there in Operation Resolute Support, and they just got home last month. They've been there for nine months. Now, what are they doing there? 
They are providing combat aviation support to American and coalition special forces and to the Afghan security forces in their fight against extremists in Afghanistan that are trying to topple the government. And those are Al-Qaeda remnants, it's the Taliban, and a lot of the Taliban come out of Pakistan, uh, and it's also ISIS or ISIS-inspired extremists. So what we're hoping against hope, and it's a tough hope, is that the elected government of Afghanistan will be able to stabilize the country and will be able to defend its authority to govern the country from these extremists, and it will begin to provide some sort of a decent future for the people of Afghanistan, and therefore Afghanistan will not become host to another lethal group of terrorists like those who attacked us on 9-11. So that's why our troops are over there. That is a NATO mission. It has a United Nations mandate. It is executed by NATO, by the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. That's who's in command. It's called the ISAF, International Security Assistance Force. Uh, the Americans are only one part of it. We're the, we're the most important part, okay? But we're only one part of it. And these four soldiers that you see right here, they're in a ceremony where they do were decorated with the Air Medal. The Air Medal is a combat award for aviators. These guys are flying combat operations almost every day. They're flying special forces into on air assault raids. They're taking Afghan security forces in. They're positioning forward observers that can call in airstrikes and artillery fire. They're conducting combat medevac. These four soldiers, in fact, were decorated uh, for heroism uh, in a medevac mission uh, in Afghanistan. So this isn't in the headlines, uh, but these guys are putting their, their lives on the line uh, for you and me uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, we've got a brigade combat team in Korea because one of the places we have troops permanently stationed in Korea, the 2nd Infantry Division is still permanently stationed in Korea as is the US 8th Army. Uh, this also is a United Nations command uh, UNFSK, United Nations Forces Korea, uh, or I'm sorry, United, United Nations Command Korea, UNCK, and also USFK, United States Forces Korea. United States Forces Korea are commanded by this four-star general right here. His name is Vince Brooks. And the reason that I put his uh, picture up there is he is a former Danger Six. He's a former commanding general of the 1st Infantry Division. Uh, and when he was in command of the 1st Infantry Division, he took the division headquarters to Basra, Iraq, in Operation New Dawn, and he also visited here several times during uh, his tenure. We hope that he will come to the grand opening on August 26. But if you've been reading the papers at all about what's going on in Korea, you realize he's a pretty busy guy. I sometimes think I'm busy trying to get a museum open. He's trying to prevent a war, <laughs> uh, an order of magnitude greater. One of the interesting things about the training the 1st Armor Brigade Combat Team is doing over there uh, is that it has a lot of emphasis on weapons of mass destruction and particularly um, uh, toxic gases. Uh, uh, we're more concerned about the possibility of chemical warfare, both uh, delivered by regular forces and also delivered by, um, uh, by irregular forces, by paramilitary forces, there's more emphasis on that and more concern about it than there has been since the Cold War ended in 1991. The North Koreans are known to have, manufacture, and plan to use a variety of weapons of mass destruction. Of course, what's in the headlines is their development of missiles and nuclear warheads, but uh, as uh, derivative of the Soviet Union, uh, they have uh, plenty of chemical weapons. So we're spending a lot of time on that. So that second brigade armor team that I visited in Kuwait, here, here's, here's what the life of a soldier is like. They were in Kuwait for nine months doing all those things I described. They came back to Fort Riley in July of 2016 and they had a 30 day block leave. And what 30 day block leave means is everybody goes on leave. No questions asked. You don't do anything. You turn in your weapon, turn in your equipment, take care of your finance and administration and you go on leave for 30 days. You just shut the unit down 
and let people reacquaint themselves with their families. You come back from block leave, and then the senior leaders get reassigned. So the officers and the senior non-commissioned officers go off to school, or they go to another command, or they get promoted, or they get whatever. And then you, and there's some of them stick around, and some of them don't. And then you bring in a new cadre, and you start training them up, and then you fill it up, you fill that brigade back up with new soldiers. And you do about two months of small unit training. So you gotta get squads and platoons and companies and all those sorts of things to do the basic stuff that they gotta do. So that took them from, let's say, end of August, to mid-October. Mid-October, they started gunnery. This is an armor brigade, so it it's, consists of tanks and armored personnel carriers with big guns. And gunnery means that every soldier and every crew has to qualify against pretty high standards of how to use all those weapons. So you take the whole brigade out into the field, you set up all these ranges, you do dry fire, you do blank fire, you do live fire, you do slow sort of crawl, uh, they have tables of this gunnery that go one through eight, I think, and table one is real easy by the numbers, and table eight is full up, and there's a, uh, you know, your, your, it's at a whole tank platoon, and the thing's popping in every direction. And that, it, it's exhausting. You can talk to JD back here. He's a tanker from the 1st Infantry Division. He can tell you all about gunnery. It's very, very difficult. So that took them to right up till Christmas. Then they get two weeks out for Christmas. They come back from Christmas, and they deploy to the field at Fort Riley for a big exercise. The whole brigade is out in the field again. They're out there for about six weeks. They come back in from the field and now they're going to the National Training Center at Fort Irwin, California because that's what you call a mission rehearsal exercise. That's the last exercise we put a unit through before it deploys. And when they're out there, they may be in the United States. They're not with their family. Okay, they're not going to birthdays, they're not going to anniversaries, they're not going to the school play. They're at Fort Irwin, California, mom and the kids, or in some cases dad and the kids, are back at Fort Riley, uh, uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. So they have just returned from the National Training Center and now they'll deploy to Germany sometime in July or August. So they've got a little bit of time to, to catch their breath uh, before that next deployment and that'll be nine months. In, in Germany. So if you take a two year period starting when they deployed to Kuwait to when they returned from Germany, two and a half year period, the, the soldiers with families have seen their families maybe a third of that time. And the rest of the time they're gone, they're busy, uh, they're doing what you and I ask them to do. At any rate, uh, they're gonna go uh, to Europe on Operation Atlantic Resolve. Uh, the brigade headquarters will likely be in Germany, right about there, but all the battalions will be somewhere in these Eastern European countries that are new members of the NATO alliance. And the reason that they're gonna be there is because of Russia's aggression against Ukraine. The seizure of Crimea right after the Olympics and then uh, the seizure of parts of Eastern uh, Ukraine, and then uh, very threatening gestures, cyber attacks, and all kinds of other troubles against all these other countries. These countries are the former Soviet space, and they're the former Warsaw Pact space. And there was hope at the end of the Cold War that these countries could be embraced by the democracies. They all sought democratic reform, and there was hope that that they would be welcomed into the community of democratic nations. They are terrified of the Russians and have been for years. And so they wanted military assurances from the West in addition to help establishing their democracies. Make a long story short, the politicians in the United States and in Europe thought it was a wise thing to make them members of the NATO alliance. They are now members. If you remember after 9-11, attack on one is an attack on all. The, uh, the AWACS planes on 9-11 flying over American airspace after we shut down all the airplanes were our NATO allies. They were German, Italian, Canadian, and British because we had been attacked. Our NATO allies responded by sending their military assets to protect us in accordance with Article 5 uh, of the NATO alliance. So now we have 
an obligation to protect these new NATO members. So that's where that brigade will be training and operating and conducting exercises to make it very clear to Russia from a military point of view that we consider these new allies to be allies in the same sense that the traditional allies, Germany, Italy, Norway, Denmark, so on and so forth are. So that's what they're gonna be doing there. Uh, these are the troops that are there now. Uh, these are tanks and artillery of the 4th Infantry Division uh, out at range firing. This range firing is in Poland. Uh, this is in Lithuania. So that tells you all, takes you, so that's a tour of the world, right, with the 1st Infantry Division. Now here's where I went last month. I went to Baghdad, Iraq to visit the headquarters of the 1st Infantry Division. Major General Joe Martin is the commanding general and he and his headquarters are over there. And, I, and if, you were, if you came here looking for war stories, you're not gonna see too many uh, because we're over there as a headquarters. We're not over there fighting, okay? And so for the most part, I visited headquarters and interviewed people who worked in headquarters, but those are highly classified places where I can't take any pictures. So the only picture I could take inside the headquarters, the 1st Infantry Division, is that one right there. Uh, you walk in the entranceway, and there's a sign there. <laughs> you can see the big red one, and then these are the flags of all the countries that contribute troops. And what they are called is the Combined Joint Force Land Component Command, CJFLIC. All right, that's a DOD acronym. And actually, it's CJFLIC OIR because OIR stands for Operation Inherent Resolve, and that's the name that we have given to the U.S. military effort to assist the Iraqis in their fight against ISIS. So that's what all that is about. Now, what does all that stand for? <laughs> well, we have forces over there, so let's concentrate on that middle word. They are the headquarters of a force. Well, what kind of force? The land forces, okay? We, the, the General Martin doesn't command the air forces and he doesn't command the naval forces. He commands the land forces. They are a component of this greater force that does include the air and the navy, and so that's why they call it a um, uh, uh, component. But it's joint, and joint means multi-service. So all the services contribute to this land component command principally the Marine Corps, because the Marines are also a land force. They're not part of the Army, but they're, uh, and there are some sailors and there are some uh, airmen uh, in the mix uh, as well. And so joint means, I'm sorry, joint means multi-service, combined means allied. It means more than one country. And I'll talk about this in a little bit, but look at all those flags. Those are the flags of some of the 23 countries that have troops as part of the CJ flick in Iraq. So the United States is not doing this by itself by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, so what are your questions about this chart? <laughs> There's the United States Central Command. They command, that's a four-star general, I think, that commands everything in the Middle East that belongs to the United States. And under him, there is a combined joint task force operation inherent, res uh, uh, inherent whatever, uh, inherent resolve. <laughs> right, and that's a, that's a three-star general, army general. And that person does command air and naval parts, okay? And then under him is Joe Martin, the commanding general of the 1st Infantry Division, a two-star, and he commands CJ Flick OIR, and they have a operation center in Erbil up in the north and an operation center in Baghdad, and they also command a bunch of other uh, uh, pieces of ground forces contributed by other units. His uh, partner in crime is the Special Operations Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve. All the special forces people report to a different two-star, and then these two guys uh, coordinate with each other or report to their boss a three star. So that's how it's organized. Um, and, if, and, and this is some of the team. So this is Joe Martin. Uh, I interviewed him, had dinner with him. Very busy guy, very capable guy. He's the commanding general of the 1st Infantry Division. All these people help him. So these two guys are his regular deputy commanders. 
one-star general named Scott Efflant. I had uh, interviewed him and had lunch with him. He's commanding the operations center up north in Erbil. Uh, Bill Turner is the de uh, deputy commander for support, and he oversees logistics. Uh, this Marine general uh, is a deputy commanding general and assists uh, General Martin with understanding Marines. And this guy is from the Italian Army. I interviewed him, Francesco Maria Cervolo. And uh, he's, he is the senior Italian officer in theater, and he is a deputy commanding general of the CJ Flick. Uh, this is their mission. So the, some of the important words there. Uh, dash, D-A apostrophe E-S-H, is the Arabic pejorative term for ISIS or ISIL. Uh, take your pick. Uh, the, the, the terrorists that we've been fighting since 2014. Now, you may remember that in 2013 and 2014, Al-Qaeda in Iraq sort of morphed into ISIS, and ISIS had a long run and overran most of western Iraq and was outside of Baghdad. At that time, the United States had left Iraq for all practical purposes. We had ended Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, the Iraqis invited us back in. They said, we can't defeat these guys without your help. Won't you please come back in and help? And we said, <laughs> okay. But there were conditions. This is not the occupation of Iraq. The, the people leading the fight against ISIS are Iraqis. It's the Iraqi president, it's the Iraqi Ministry of Defense, it's the Iraqi Joint Chiefs of Staff, it's the Iraqi Field Commanders, it's the Iraqi Security Forces, it's the Iraqi National Police, it's the Iraqis. We're not in charge, we can't tell them what to do, and we don't tell them what to do. Everything is, whoop, by, with, and through regional partners. What that means is by the Iraqis, with the Iraqis, through the Iraqis, with the Iraqis' approval. And it drives some of the Americans absolutely crazy because we really can't initiate anything unless the Iraqis ask us to do it, okay? Now what our advisors can do is they can say, you really ought to ask for this now because we have it and it would really be useful, why don't you ask, okay? So there's a lot of that going on. But if there isn't an Iraqi request, then we can't act. And even after we make a plan to meet an Iraqi request from a field commander, say, it's got to pass muster with the government of Iraq. And there's a setup for how you do that. Uh, and uh, notice that the US military is not being asked to rebuild Iraq. Okay, the military defeat of ISIS is what their task is help the Iraqis militarily defeat ISIS so that some kind of political solution can follow. Those are the flags of all the countries that are contributing troops. There are 39 sovereign nations that have troops on the ground in Iraq helping us. And I met those officers and non-commissioned officers of those countries in the headquarters. They have real jobs in the headquarters uh, the headquarters is mostly the headquarters of the 1st Infantry Division, but if you walk into any staff section, there'll be five officers wearing big red one shoulder patches and five officers from other countries. And they're all working in there together, they're speaking English, they're not having any problem. I met and interviewed soldiers from Australia, Canada, where'd it go, uh, Denmark, uh, Estonia, France, uh, Italy, New Zealand, Norway, Spain, Sweden, and the UK, okay? And that was in just a, a, a couple of days that I was in there. I was amazed at the determination of these officers. I flew into Iraq on a C-17 cargo plane and sat next to a Danish colonel. And I, I looked at him and I said, do you speak English? He says, of course I do, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah. You know, this guy's been a NATO officer for 25 years, right? So of course he speaks English. And I said, so tell me, what, what are you doing? What, what, you know, how, how do you look at this? This guy has been deployed Danish. He's been deployed seven times to Afghanistan and Iraq since 9-11. 
And I asked him what he thought about this deployment, and he said, this is our fight. If we don't beat these people here, they're going to come to Denmark. He says, they're going to come to Europe. He says, this is the fight of the entire Western world. I'm happy to be part of it. He says, Denmark could not possibly do this by ourselves, but if you Americans will come in, we will be glad to latch on and do what we can. And then he pointed out that the eight C-130 cargo aircraft that were on the tarmac just outside the cargo plane that we were sitting on are twice the size of the uh, Danish Air Force uh, in terms of cargo planes. He says, you have eight sitting there on the tarmac waiting for something to do. We have four in our entire Air Force. So uh, it's, it's not that any one of them, any one of these countries brings a lot to the table, but every one of them brings something. And the motivation, dedication uh, of the allied officers that I talked to was unbelievable. And the New Zealanders and Australia, what, what are you guys doing here? Right? You're not part of NATO. This is the Middle East. It's not your neighborhood. Same attitude. Same attitude. This is our fight. This is a fight that the Western, that Western civilization, the Western democracies have got to win. Uh, so here's Iraq. I flew into Kuwait, commercial, Lufthansa. Uh, landed at the commercial airport, was picked up by my military escorts, driven over to an American air base, uh, spent the night, uh, got in a plane the next morning, flew up to Baghdad, uh, spent a couple days in our headquarters there with the 1st Infantry Division, and then they put me on a helicopter and flew me out uh, into Anbar province between Fallujah and our Ramadi. I spent a couple days at a Marine base there, came back to Baghdad, and then flew up uh, to Erbil, which is there, but that first circle is Mosul. Mosul is where all the fighting is going on right now because they're trying to, they've cleared eastern Mosul of the ISIS forces and they're trying to clear western Mosul. I was never in any significant danger. I didn't hear a shot fired. I didn't get anywhere near Mosul. Uh, they wouldn't, definitely wouldn't let me do that. Uh, we do have American troops on the ground. They're from the 82nd Airborne Division. They report to General Martin as the commander of CJ Flick, and they're the embedded advisors who actually go in on the ground uh, with the Iraqi security forces. Uh, but I, 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 that was too close for, for them to take a 67-year-old, uh, civil, essentially civilian, who's just curious. Uh, <laughs> this is the progress we're making, okay? Uh, ISIS uh, still controls uh, the areas shown in sort of a dark green on that. It's a real problem because the caliphate that they've claimed straddles the boundary between Syria and Iraq, which is right here, okay? The areas in red, they are still capable of conducting, there's enough ISIS on the ground that they're capable of conducting offensive operations in those areas and uh, the areas in brown are areas where, um, uh, where, we're not, uh, where we have not entirely cleared the ISIS presence out of. Now, most of that area is desert. It's uninhabited desert. So it's a little more dramatic on here than, the, than it actually is. And one of the things that just strikes me is so profound, this is the Fertile Crescent. This is the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley. This is uh, the Tigris River right here. This is the Euphrates River right here. That's where all the people are because everything else is desert. You've got to be close to water in order to sustain life. And we're fighting over it, hammer and tongs. And it's a tragedy. Uh, so that's the plane. I wasn't supposed to take any pictures on the airfield, so I only took one. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'd never flown on a C-17, and that's a C-17 cargo plane, and that's what took me up to Baghdad, and I would have taken pictures inside, except it was me, 12 GIs, and several tons of artillery ammunition. And the, I took the camera out, and the crew chief came running over and said, no, sir, no, sir, no cameras were to fly in ammo. And I said, oh, okay, we're flying ammo? Yeah, we're flying ammo, that's all ammo. Oh, swell, well, don't, don't crash this thing, okay? <laughs> uh, so that was fun, and... You know, this is the typical military tourist photograph. We got off on the airfield in uh, Baghdad, and I, I just wanted to prove that I had been there, so there I am. Uh, happy to be there. This, is, this caught my attention. 
So this is the, one of the very first signs you see. It's next to a little medicine cabinet looking thing with a lock on it, like with a hammer, like you break, you know, and, and that's a nerve agent antidote. And those are all over the place. Now, nothing like this ever happened, right? But it's clear when you, when you arrive that they're concerned about these things. And, and, uh, but I got to be in the executive lounge. And the executive lounge looks like that, so that's not too bad, right? I could sit on the sofa. It's a good thing they made it, they made it comfortable for me because I was there for 15 hours. Now, fortunately, everybody and his brother was going through the airport, so I met a lot of VIPs as they came and they went. And I was waiting for my ride, uh, commensurate with the high priority that they had assigned to my particular travel. Here's a map of Baghdad. There's the Baghdad International Airport. That's where I was on the far west side. The east side of that airfield is a commercial airfield. The west side is the American, uh, or the allied, but mainly American, uh, military airfield. Where I'm going is there. And if you look really, really hard at that map, you can see right in the middle of that circle, right there, there's a triangle. And that triangle is a place called Union 3. And Union 3 is a camp. That's where our headquarters is, okay? Now, remember I said, this isn't Operation Iraqi Freedom. We're not occupying Iraq. We have been invited in as guests of the Iraqi government. Part of that deal is keep as low a profile as you possibly can because we don't want the population of Iraq to get the idea that the Americans are back and occupying because most Iraqis got really, really tired of our presence there when we were there in our Operation Iraqi Freedom, even though we were trying to do the right thing. So you, except for scheduled military convoys taking essential military supplies north to the war zone, the Americans can't drive vehicles. So even though it's five miles from there to there, and in an up-armored Humvee would take about 20 minutes, you can't do that. I have to wait for the scheduled helicopter to take me over there, which took 15 hours. And I sat there until finally I was manifested on a Black Hawk. It was in the dark of night, uh, and off we went. So that's a Chinook uh, that was taxiing at the same time we are. This is what Baghdad looks like out the uh, window of a Black Hawk, a UH-60 helicopter. I was amazed at the lights and the traffic in the middle of the night. It's like flying into O'Hare. It's not as big a city, right? But the, everything is lit up. There's traffic all over the place, people coming and going. Uh, you wouldn't know that this had been a war zone uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, now, that's seen from a helicopter, right? <laughs> that's an impression from a helicopter. I was never down on the street. So, uh, and this guy, I love this guy. He was sitting there waiting for a ride to go up north. And I saw that he had a first division shoulder patch on, so I went over and talked to him. His name is Dennis Monsanto, I think. He's a trumpeter in the first infantry division band. <laughs> you know, to win our wars, we gotta have people in the band too, right? And you can see he's armed. He's got his M4 sitting right there, and his trumpet is there. And he's flying north because we'd had a casualty two days earlier, and he's the guy who's gonna go play taps at the memorial service. And here he is sitting in this hot as heck little transient place waiting on his flight. Got nobody to talk to, nothing to do. I sat down and chatted with him. That's why he's got a big grin on his face, somebody to talk to, right? It was his birthday. And so military service is not just glorious sacrifice on a field of battle somewhere. It's the discipline of submitting yourself every day to countless little sacrifices and inconveniences that are part of duty so that the job that you've been assigned by we, the people, us the people, uh, can get done. And I'm just proud of those guys. I'm proud of those girls. They're tremendous. Uh, that's where I got to live, okay? Uh, there's a palm tree, that was nice. These are shipping containers turned into apartments, uh, and they welded a handy stair on there so your uh, neighbor upstairs can get into his. And the whole compound is built around one of Saddam's old palaces. This is it. I'll show you another picture of it. These things are just trash. 
Uh, I, I, I couldn't go inside and take pictures, but they're, they're a wooden superstructure, and all of that stuff that looks like stone facing is just cheap concrete. You could take a deep breath and blow that thing over. Uh, it, there's just absolutely nothing to it. It's all for show. It's a Potemkin village. Uh, this gets your attention. CCP 8 with two red crosses on it. Casualty collection place point. So you can see that that's a concrete structure with sandbags all around it and a chest full of life-saving medical supplies. And there's maps everywhere of where these CCPs are. So if there's a mass casualty attack on the camp, this is where you collect casualties. You get them in under cover. You've got immediate life-saving supplies that you can use until the medical facility can get into action. And, uh, and those things are all over the place, just in case. Uh, so I'm standing in front of the fitness center. The fitness center is behind these blast shields right here. Uh, this is the street. There's Shaddam's palace, right? Uh, the, that last photograph, I was way down that street looking back this way. Uh, those are more CCPs there. That's a great big uh, tanker truck delivering water. Potable water is a, uh, a safe, secure, Steady supply of potable water is absolutely critical to our presence in the Middle East. Troops have to drink water, right? We're human beings. Uh, this is the mess hall, the dining facility. It's surrounded by Jersey barriers. You go in right there, you can see a couple of GIs about to go have breakfast. And then it's got this big cap on it. So all the troop billeting areas in Baghdad or places where there would be a lot of soldiers at one time, like in a dining facility, have that extra layer of protection. So if there's a rocket attack, the, ro the incoming uh, fire would hit that roof and explode uh, and not explode, in, not penetrate uh, the facility and explode on the floor where it would do a lot more damage. Um, then I wasn't supposed to go up on the roof, but I did. Uh, and I took this picture uh, and there, there's the other end of the dining facility. There's the fitness center behind the blast shields. These are more CCPs here. This is the main road coming down and that you're looking to the right. And then if, if I do an about face from here and walk over to the other side of the roof, okay, I can look over Baghdad. Uh, the perimeter wall of Union 3 is right there and runs all the way along there. This is all logistics stuff you can see construction outside the perimeter. Uh, right there, you can see a sort of triangle thing. Those are those great big crossed uh, sabers uh, that are left over from the Saddam area. But I, I never got outside these camps, right? So I can't really tell you much about that. I interviewed a lot of people. Uh, that's General Martin just before uh, my buddy Mike and I had dinner with him. Uh, this, is, uh, this is General um, uh, Cherovolo. Uh, the uh, Italian uh, Brigadier, this is Command Sergeant Major Joe Cornelison, who's the Command Sergeant Major of the 1st Infantry Division. So I spent a lot of time doing that, uh, but I also talked to troops. These are staff officers, this guy, uh, Eli Ingram right in the middle, he's the guy who coordinated our visit. These are some of the guys that work with him. These two guys are local. If you read my article in the Daily Herald after I got back, uh, I tracked down, when I, wherever I went, I tracked down soldiers that are from this area. Uh, and I, I wrote about them. Uh, Sergeant Kim, I think, is from Burr Ridge, and uh, Sergeant Dobin is from um, uh, Elgin, I think. And this guy's name is Rob Moore, and he's a British officer who's in the same office as these guys. Um, so that's some of the people. Then I flew out to uh, Camp Mannion. So this is the flight in the Chinook. Uh, this is desert country, all on bar province. Once you get out of Baghdad, this is what you see in every direction for as far as you can see. It's all desert. Al Anbar province goes for miles and miles and miles and miles over to Syria, uh, but it's all trackless desert for the most part. Uh, so here we are, all kitted up, and I'll show you what it's like to be on that flight. giant lake, a 
name of that lake is Habania, Lake Habania, and it's out by Arvo Mati. We were flying over it. And you can see the little tiny strip of green there right on the edge of the lake, but you don't get more than about 100 yards and you're done. And then I lost control of my iPhone. Somebody asked me a question. I forgot what I was doing. <laughs> and then we'll look at the next one. Now we're flying into Camp Mannion, right? So there's Camp Mannion. It's on an airfield. Lake Cabanilla is behind us. We've crossed it. Now you can see the lead bird in our flight will appear right here. There he is. He's going into land. That's an Iraqi air base there. This is the American camp where I'm going. Off we go. Uh, way in the distance is Aramadi, the city of Aramadi. First Division fought there in 2005, 2006. And this is kind of like Fort Apache in a lot of ways, right? You'll get another look at it in a second. Uh, there. So it's this triangle-shaped military base right next to the airfield, uh, run by the Marine Corps, but it has troops of all the services there doing different things. Uh, and I'll tell you in a second. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you right now what it was like to be there. So now I'm inside Camp Mannion, and that's a, that's a panographic picture that gives you an idea what the interior is. This is not luxury living by any stretch of the imagination. This is a hard-packed uh, desert gravel floor, uh, very hot, by now much hotter than when I was there. Uh, the camp headquarters, it's an old Iraqi air base, so the camp headquarters is in that old hangar where the antennas are, uh, and you can see the HESCO barriers, that's the inner um, uh, perimeter wall, and then there's an outer perimeter wall of just bulldozed uh, ground. Uh, these are some of the things that I did there. So we're flying um, drone uh, reconnaissance missions out of there. So this is an RQ-7 Shadow drone, and this is the crew from the 1st Cavalry Division. I think we got some 1st Cavalry Division people here, uh, yeah, over here at the table, right? And they're flying reconnaissance. Now, the purpose of this camp is several fold. One is, it's to make sure we have access to that airfield, so that if we ever have to bring more troops back into this part of Iraq, we've got control of the airfield. There's a major Iraqi headquarters on the other side of that airstrip that is in command of three Iraqi divisions that are doing stability operations in this whole AO. And what stability means is peace, security, and looking for and trying to take out any remaining ISIS, Al-Qaeda fighters that are in that area. We have a liaison team in that headquarters that gives advice and assistance to those to that headquarters in those divisions, and then anything that they want us to do comes back to Camp Mannion, and the commander at Camp Mannion either gets it done or passes it up to a higher level headquarters that can get it done. Uh, he's got his own artillery in there. Uh, one, one section is self-propelled 155 millimeter um, artillery, and they can fire, in, they can take calls for fire either from the Iraqis or from other allied forces that may be out there. Uh, these are not weaponized. There, there are no weaponized drones uh, at Camp Mannion. These are all reconnaissance, but they fly reconnaissance uh, all over the area and the, the, the downlink feeds go to the Iraqi headquarters, the US headquarters, sometimes directly to an American that's embedded uh, with the Iraqis patrolling there. Uh, this is the aid station. Uh, this is run by the Marine Corps, so these are naval corpsmen, but there happened to be one American uh, buck sergeant medic that was uh, stationed with them. So I sent this to my good friend Bob Adams, who I think many of you know. He's a, he was a Navy corpsman in Vietnam, and I said, Bob, I thought you'd like this picture of Navy corpsmen. These are your descendants here in the aid station, and note that they got a, a lieutenant here as the doc, and three corpsmen as the medics and an army sergeant could keep them in line. So, <laughs> uh, and then I thought this is cool since this is a marine base. You see that thing right there that looks like a garbage can and it's got uh, a, the barrel of a gun sticking out of it? That's a phalanx. And if some of you may know what a phalanx is, a phalanx is an anti-missile gun system that's developed by the Navy and mounted on ships. 
and its purpose is to shoot down cruise missiles. And that radar is really sensitive. And the reason those things are there is because the Marines stole it from the Navy and put it there. <laughs> but if you have indirect fire, which is the biggest threat that, to this little base, if you have indirect fire, meaning mortar fire or artillery fire, that radar is sensitive enough that it can pick up that shot like this skew that gun over, fire a burst of rounds, and, and take the round out in flight. Uh, so that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. Uh, so anyway, I thought that was cool. So that's Camp Mannion. Uh, this is sunset at Camp Mannion. It reminds us that uh, there's beauty in this world, even in some of the worst places you would want to be. Uh, they, I had, flew out by C-130 uh, back to Camp Taji. This is the transient thing, then back to Baghdad to catch a State Department flight up to Erbil, uh, and that was the inside of the C-130. Um, this is a flight up to Erbil. Uh, you leave Baghdad, you go through northern Iraq, and you're looking down at desert most of the way. But as you get into the north, you get into the Kurdish part of Iraq, and it starts to turn green because you're getting closer and closer to the mountains that are along the border between northern Iraq and Turkey. And so there's a watershed off of those mountains. It's a much cooler climate, higher elevation, a lot more moisture, and so a lot more greenery. And so, uh, and Erbil is both an ancient and modern city. I wasn't in a particularly good seat, but you can get an idea of the outskirts of Erbil right there in the greenery as we started to approach the airfield. Now, that's where I lived. I'm, I'm standing in the troop barracks looking back at the building that I lived in. They had a, uh, this is an officer's quarters. You can see the security fence and security wall around it. Uh, and the next morning, I got up on this platform and took pictures that I'm gonna show you in a minute. But what this uh, operation center is, is it's a strike center. It's called Strike Cell Erbil. And it's really, 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 really important because they got a little headquarters in there and all the requests for fire support that are coming from the Iraqis to the Americans, to the coalition, go into Strike Center Erbil. And Strike Center Erbil has yes or no authority. There's a general in there. Every day he has to say, yes, shoot that target. Yes, shoot that target. No, don't shoot that target. Kick, kick that one up higher. Uh, you know, do 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 Almost all the strikes are fast mover airstrikes. They're either naval or marine air coming out of both the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean, or they're Air Force air coming out of US air bases uh, in, our, in the GCC uh, countries. There's about 40 a day. So this is a no kidding fight. Now that's not B-52 arc-like strikes like in Vietnam where there's a whole flight of B-52s dropping a belly full of iron bombs. Uh, a strike is a single launch of a precision-guided munition. Uh, it, about 80% of the strikes are fast movers, uh, but about 20% are either artillery, uh, special forces, or Army aviation, attack helicopters by Army aviation. And this, this little headquarters of about 45 people runs that whole thing, okay? That, that's what they do. And they've got a whole complicated system and I watched it, it was classified, and I, don't, I no longer have a, a, a clearance, so I told General Efland, I said, you know, I got no clearance. He says, forget it, come on in, it's no problem. <laughs> I had to leave my iPhone, I couldn't take any pictures, all your iPhones have to be left in an antechamber outside. And he says, everything you see in here is highly classified, he says, but it's gonna change in 15 minutes. He says, and I know you can't remember it, so just, just watch. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, okay, I'll do that. And it was fascinating. And one of the desks, I wish I could, I wish I had a picture because every position, there's a big horseshoe of desks and a computer at every station. And then as you might imagine, there's all these LCD screens and each LCD screen is something else. It's the weather, it's the enemy situation, it's And then every one of these people has a function, right? And one of the ones that was closest to where I was sitting is the SJA, and SJA is Staff Judge Advocate, that's the military lawyer. So one of the people that is sitting there 24-7 and voting on whether we hit a target or not 
is a military lawyer, and his job is to make sure that what we do is consistent with international and US law, that we're not just firing things all over the place. I was amazed at the length of effort that they go through to clear targets, and then of course they have to clear those targets to the government of Iraq. They have to say, your guys asked us to hit this target, here's what it consists of, here's why they want it hit, here's what we think we can do to it, are we good to go or not? And the Iraqis will say, yes or no. Uh, so, but, but I, can't, I can't show you pictures of any of that. So I was up on top of that roof, and this is looking due south. And this is the old Erbil International Airport. It's no longer used as a commercial airport, and the military has moved in there. You can see all the antennas because the, the, this is, man, we are so dependent on our cyber capability and communications and satellite downlinks and all that kind of stuff. It's a different world from when some of us were putting up two nine or two antennas and talking on FM radios. Uh, but at any rate, that's, that's what it is, and there's the city of Erbil in the distance, and you can get a look. Everything back here on the east side of the airfield is all the Coalition Special Operations Aviation. So you can see some of the propellers over there, but there was, there was uh, 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 all their funny aircraft uh, are parked over there. I wasn't supposed to take any pictures of that either. Uh, so then I, I turned around and I, I looked due north. So now I went to the opposite side of that roof and looked due north. And this is a panographic uh, picture, so actually that railing is a straight line, right? But over in the distance is the Erbil Commercial Airport. It's a commercial airport, people flying out of it, in and out of it all the time, and then the military compound over here. That's where all the troops from the 1st Division, you see the camouflage tents? Uh, that's where all the troops from the 1st Division are. That's a fitness center, that's a USO uh, MWR, uh, Morale Welfare Recreation Center. Uh, this is the PX, these two trailers, there's the dining facility. Uh, troops, uh, they got a security wall here, they come out through either that gate or that gate, come over here through this gate, eat, uh, and then go to work in the, um, uh, in the strike center or, or one of the various facilities we have supporting the strike center. Uh, that's what the company headquarters looks like. Uh, here are the two women soldiers who were my escort officers uh, while I was there. Uh, very capable, cheerful, bright uh, young women. Uh, this guy, I, I, I'll tell you about him later. Uh, his name is Ben Hoos. He's a Nebraska National Guardsman who was called up for this deployment, assigned to the 1st Division. That's another story. A lot of the troops that are there are reservists or guards. Uh, uh, National Guard members that have been mobilized to supplement the headquarters. Uh, his job was the humanitarian aspect. There's a whole other dimension of this stuff that you never read about in the papers, ab about the, how, how we're helping the refugees that got out of the way of ISIS and now want to go back as the uh, Iraqi security forces are liberating their villages and these people are in camps and they want to go back. It's not safe to go back, but they have all kinds of needs. Blah, 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 blah. And there's all these NGOs, non-governmental organizations, humanitarian organization, the United Nations is in there. But everything they do has to be coordinated through the military so that nobody gets shot, and that was his job. And how he got it all done, I really don't know, but he's a good guy. Uh, that's what Erbil looks like. That's a map of modern Erbil, but Erbil has been there for 7,000 years, okay? And it started off, just in that tiny little circle right there. And then they kept building suburbs. You talk about urban sprawl, right? <laughs> and so this is what it looks like now. And so one of the things before I left, uh, they said, well, you wanna go see the Citadel? I said, is it safe? And they said, no. I said, well, then I probably don't wanna go. And they said, well, the general's not going anywhere today, so you can take his personal security detail. I said, well, who are those guys? Well, that's a six, Tough looking thugs, right? <laughs> no, they're great soldiers. But anyway, off we went with them. And uh, I want to take a lot more pictures, but this is the Citadel, so that's the wall, that's the south side of that tiny little circle I just showed you. This is a mosque, this is a shopping bazaar, and these are people, and you can see they're a little bit suspicious about me, or about our, our, our vehicles. We're trying to maintain a low profile. And we got closer to this thing, and this is a tell. You know what a tell is? In the Middle East, the 
They've built cities for so many thousands of years on top of each other that they have created artificial hills. And all of that is the rubble of the previous cities that were there. It's not a natural hill. It was amazing for me to see this. And I even, you know, kind of kicked at it just to convince myself that it's rubble. It's rubble. It's not dirt and bedrock and, and stuff like that. And it was just sort of amazing to be there. We climbed up to the top, and now we're looking back at uh, that previous picture was taken from right there. There's the shopping bazaar. There's the mosque. This is the park. Uh, people pretty much like us going about their business. Uh, these are the security guys. Now, this guy got a little goofy. He's about to fall off that wall. Uh, but you can see there's a guy there, there's a guy there, I was here, and then there's another guy over there. And they made me uncomfortable because everywhere I went, they'd spread out around me, right? <laughs> and I'm nobody, right? But that what they really, really, really didn't want was something to happen to me, and they have to explain that. So uh, I had more protection than I needed. So here's some ideas, and I've already hit on these. Coalition partners, able, willing, and critical. Uh, this is not OIF. We're guests, not occupiers. Uh, initiative of the Iraqis. The fight for Mosul is serious. The Iraqis are taking heavy casualties in street-by-street -street fighting that is more like World War II than anything we've experienced in recent times. Uh, but, they're, but they're staying in the fight. They're not giving up. Remember when they ran away uh, in 2014 from ISIS? They're not doing that. Uh, I can't go into the details, but the intelligence people were telling me about all of the data they've got on how ISIS uses hostages and, uh, and packs targets with children, with families, uh, knowing that we'll hit it uh, in hopes of uh, killing as many as possible and then using the propaganda against us. Uh, Kurdistan acts like a nation state, and so the government of Iraq cannot necessarily agree on behalf of the Kurdish province of Erbil. So you have to play mother may I twice with everything you're supposed to do. You have to get clearance from the government of Iraq and clearance from the provincial government, which is Kurdish. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, I've already mentioned that our operations are highly dependent on cyber superiority and command of the air. Uh, we do way more than combat operations. Uh, I could talk about that. Uh, so that's in Iraq, but generally, uh, all of those points, and I think the most important one to me is that top one. All those big red one patches around the world, okay, since nine, after World War II, the United States was the most powerful country on the planet. And that situation existed for about 50 years. And it is now changing. The change was inevitable. The countries that were ruined by World War II, devastated by World War II, are recovering and becoming stronger. The international order that was created by the United States in the wake of World War II, the creation of the United Nations, the creation of the International Monetary Fund, the creation of NATO, the creation of all of these international agreements, all of those were to prevent another world war because the people who created those looked back at World War I and World War II and realized we now had nuclear weapons and said we gotta come up with another way. So we have benefited from that international order for generations, for about 70 years. It is under terrible strain. It is challenged by Russia, by China, by Iran, by terrorists, and our soldiers are deployed around the world in defense of that international order. It is vitally important to our peace, our security, and our prosperity that that order not wither. Uh, and that, to me, was the big takeaway, and I'll tell you, all those international officers I talked to, I think if they were here, they would be telling you exactly uh, the same thing. It doesn't matter if it was 1918, 1944, 1967, 2010. The 1st Infantry Division, 
The American Armed Forces are about some brave young American going to a dangerous place to risk his or her life because you and I ask them to do it because it benefits us. And we should never forget that. Thank you. Okay, I got a few minutes. If anybody's got a question, I'd be glad to entertain them. Yes, sir. Um, one of the requirements for the officers to serve on the international staff is that they speak English, okay? And I did not encounter any who did not. But it is a great question because as you, as you work your way down through the headquarters, right, all these countries are, re, are, are contributing trainers that are supposed to be training the Iraqis. Well, the Iraqis might speak Arabic, they might speak Tur uh, Kurdish, in some cases, they speak other dialects, and the trainer who is out there might be from Poland, might be from Estonia, might be from Sweden, might be from... It, it's a huge problem of communications. Uh, the, 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 coin, the language of the realm that everybody speaks a little bit is bad English. So that's how we try to moderate it. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, do you want to pass uh, microphones around? I'm sorry. One of the things, uh, uh, did you have any, uh, uh, it, is there any coordination with Syria and uh, Jordan and that area at all in these kind of? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I asked a question like that and was, and was told it couldn't be discussed. Um, if, if there is, there is, I am certain that there is no coordination whatsoever with the government of Syria. Okay, but the mission statement that I showed earlier is the military defeat of Daesh. Daesh covers both countries, Iraq and Syria. We, and it's been in the paper that we have special operations forces that are at work in Syria, uh, and, and that is a more complicated dance than you can possibly imagine. The, the government of Syria is a combatant ISIS is a combatant. There are anti-Assad um, uh, uh, forces that are a combatant. The Russians are a combatant and were a combatant. Uh, and, and so that's a very, very dangerous place. And I, I, but I don't have a lot of personal insight into how that is stitched up. Yeah, Jack. Paul, speaking of, uh, was there any discussion of after Daesh is defeated in a certain area, of the influence of Iran or Hezbollah, militia, Shia forces, or and or Russia? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, that was another thing that when I asked, I didn't get a lot of clear answers. But the, the anti-Daesh forces include Shia militias that are armed and abetted by Iran. Okay, so, so this is not a pretty picture. Most of the ISIS terrorists that we're definitely against, most of them are Sunni, okay? Most of the Iraqi government and the Iraqi security forces are Shia, not entirely, but most of them are Shia. Then there are also paramilitary militias operating in Iraq against ISIS, which we like, but loyal to Iran, which we don't like. And so the, the question of once ISIS is defeated, who then is cock of the walk in Iraq and what is the political solution that will prevent a, re, a, a reemergence of ISIS and the proper governance of the country of Iraq and will that be credible enough that we won't have other terrorists and extremists uh, trying to move or, or the Iranians themselves uh, trying to move in and, and dismember Iraq. I don't know the answers to those questions, okay? Uh, and and I'm, I'm not sure exactly who does. For General Martin at the two-star level at CJ Flick, his, his mission is clear, the military defeat of Daesh on the expectation that the governments are, are going to work on this post-conflict stage, right? 
Now, the last thing I'll say about that is that in the advice and assistance that we're giving, apparently, we're talking to our Iraqi con counterparts almost every day about that problem. You, you know, okay, this is great. We're gonna get Mosul back. We're gonna defeat ISIS, but what then? And, and how does this place stick together uh, afterwards? I don't know the answer, it's a great question. Yeah, Kevin. Chow was great. Uh, 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 yeah, I, I, you can go into a mess hall almost 24-7. Uh, the, in every meal, there's a variety of food. You can go to the salad bar, you can go to the sandwich bar, you can have uh, an omelet made to order. Uh, there are no GIs uh, in the chow line or, or washing dishes or anything like that. That's all contract, for the most part, uh, uh, Third Nation. Uh, there's a lot of Filipinos uh, that, are, that work in there. Uh, there are Army mess sergeants that sort of supervise the whole food service operation, make sure it's sanitary and that Army regulations for food service are followed. Uh, but it was really good food. Now, um, uh, uh, so it's nothing like some of us of a certain age may remember from our own days in the service. <laughs> Uh, it's much, 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 much better. Right, the, the GIs are, are, don't have that perspective because this is what they've known, right? So they grumble a little bit, but they're getting pretty well fed. Uh, no, uh, the, um, uh, those, those tents you saw with the camouflage nets over them, they all have a big box air conditioner at the end, which brings the temperature down from like 95 to maybe 70, 75, which is not too bad, depending on how close you are to the air conditioner. Uh, the offices are fitfully air conditioned uh, and the recreation facilities are air conditioned. So if you need to get out of the heat, you can. Another thing, I, I didn't show you, I could show you a million pictures, but I'd be talking here all night. But I took pictures of the USO. USO was everywhere I went. Every single, no matter how humble that little camp was, there was a morale, uh, welfare, recreation facility uh, managed by the USO. And uh, the big things are you can make a telephone call there or you can get online and, and do email with your, uh, with your family, which all the troops like to do. But there was also, you know, you could get big screen TV and you can watch shows and uh, foosball games and you know, just, just something besides whatever your duties are. So I thought that was pretty good. Oh. Uh, yeah, I left on the 2nd or 3rd of May and came home on the 10th. So I was, I was out over there about eight or nine days. The strike on the, oh, oh, oh the, our strike on the Syrian airfield? Oh, no, that happened, that happened before I went over there and it was, hundreds of miles away, that was in Syria. So I, I really don't have any insight to that. One of the things though, the, our major military facilities are on old Iraqi facilities, and I have pictures of this too, but I didn't show them, but every one of those, there, there are these great big concrete hangars that used to house a jet fighter of the Iraqi Air Force, right? And every one of them, every single one of them has a big old hole right in the top, <laughs> blown, to smithereens and broken concrete in every direction, and that's Desert Storm. Those are the airstrikes in Desert Storm. We flew all those, you know, the air war in January and February. Uh, we took that air, that air Force said goodbye. Um, so that was pretty cool. Uh, okay, so thank you for your attention. I'll stick around and answer questions. I think, do we, is Alicia, come back for Greg if he ever resurfaces. Uh, but his book is for sale in the gift shop, and uh, uh, and remember our troops, they're, st they're, they're still deployed. We're not thinking about it. They're still deployed. They're still in danger. They're doing hard things. They're doing it for us, and we need to support them. When they come home, we need to welcome them home and thank them.